Hello and welcome to Red Red. Today I have a probably short video talking about Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima. Uh, this is the second novel of Mishima's. It was released in 1949 and it's also the second novel of his that I have read. Uh, I did read A Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that novel when I read it but I actually sort of enjoyed it a little bit more in retrospect after having read this and sort of now seeing the diverse style uh, with which Mishima could write because uh, as I've talked about with authors like Nabokov uh, you do need to read a couple uh, and this is probably the case with every author you do need to read a few of their works in order to get a, a more clear understanding of what their uh, style is like uh, and so yeah I really enjoyed uh, reading Confessions of a Mask and I'll give some general plot summary stuff um, uh, and then I'll just go through some of my annotations. Basically, uh, the book, like I said, was released in 1949, four years after the end of the war, which is really interesting because uh, of the events. Like, basically, the our main character, whose name is only mentioned once as Ko-chan, uh, which is thought to be an allusion to Yukio Mishima's real name, uh, or like the diminutive diminutive of his real name uh, and it's very very autobiographical or implied to be very autobiographical I can imagine Mishima would have been a little bit hesitant to have been open about a lot of things but you sort of become open about it as soon as you write a book like this uh, and things like the main character is exactly the same age as Mishima born in 1925 and uh, expresses uh, basically, the story is that at around the age of four, our main character realizes that he is uh, a homosexual and b also a sadomasochist. Um, and basically, it's a bildungsroman where uh, going through being uh, young and gay in Japan and uh, going through the war and after the war. The the book ends pretty pretty much around the end of 1945, which I thought was which is what surprised me about how quickly the book must have been written um, and it, it seems like because it's autobiographical-esque I imagine that Mishima just sat down and wrote this in like this great big fever dream pitch uh, and a lot of it would have come pretty naturally to him but uh, what I wanted to talk about and make a video is just to point out that if you've read The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea, Mishima had a, a bit of an agenda. He did want to represent the sailor as sort of uh, the kind of archetype of Japan and then being sort of uh, emasculated uh, by... Um, uh, with the with the young son, I'm forgetting the son's name, but you know the son is talking about how he wants this kind of great father figure, uh, but the sailor um, is sort of more relaxed and chill, and the and the son or, or the child uh, lashes out at him, and the and the mother, the the woman, she's sort of working in and selling. Uh, I believe it's like Western Western uh, uh, furniture and and whatnot, uh, and it is this whole idea, this big commentary of of Mishima talking about um, the loss of imperialism in Japan, of of which he was obviously very passionate. But reading something like this, it is just such a such a contrast. And uh, what stood out to me straight away. I don't know if this is a, a big credit to give to the translator who um, uh, was translated by Meredith Weatherby. But the style and the prose of writing is so, like, clear, and you can tell that it is it is Mishima, and you can tell that it is his voice. But I think uh, 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 Weatherby did an amazing job at translating it and kind of, uh, like, maintaining the voice, like the the Japanese style, which you know, for uh, if that is such a thing that even exists, but it is something that you hear and that you feel when you read, like. Kawabata and Dazai and and so on and I guess Abe but yeah yeah I just wanted to well I just to just to finish off with the plot summary buildings Roman a kind of our main character grows up starts to have some uh, fascinations and some idolizations of of uh, of boys um uh, namely Omi Omi who is like an older older senpai in in his class but then because of some situations or like some events uh, he falls out of love with him and then you know questions whether or not he was in love with him and he falls in love with a girl uh, named Sonoko uh, but realize that, realizes that he doesn't have any sexual desires to be with her but he still kind of loves her essence and it's a really great it's a really great story um uh, and that but that is basically it you know the end of the story is just like where Mishima was in his life at uh, 1945 uh, you know right at the end of the war 1946 maybe I'll read out some extracts and I'll just kind of talk about them or riff off them but just to give an idea uh, this is 
I'm, I may be still in this frame of mind because I just recently read and talked about uh, Rilke's The Notebooks of Malta Lawrence Briggs, but I'm really fascinated with kind of intensely, intensely deep introspective meditations and books that are sort of written in a almost journal or, or diary style, and this gave me some of that. So, what I mean is that toward his occupation, I felt something like a yearning for a piercing sorrow, a body wrenching sorrow. His occupation gave me the feeling of tragedy in the most sensuous, uh, in the most sensuous meaning of the word, a certain feeling, as it were, of self renunciation, a certain feeling of indifference, a certain feeling of intimacy with danger, a feeling like a remarkable mixture of nothingness and vital power. All these feelings swarmed forth from his calling, bore down upon me, and took me captive at the age of four. Probably I had I had a misconception of the work of a night soil man. Probably I had been told of some different occupation and, misled by his costume, was forcibly fitting his job into the pattern of, of what I had heard. I cannot otherwise explain it. And uh, that was something that, even though I didn't get as much of it in this novel as I did reading Snow Country, uh, I, I really like when... Japanese authors write about write in an impressionistic uh, manner, and maybe not nece maybe not literally impressionistic like the genre, but talking about um, the using allegories and analogies and allusions to just talk about how things seem as opposed to how they are, and that's something that I remember like really clearly noticing in Snow Country, where it, it felt like our main character in that book more often talked about how the environment seemed as opposed to how it was but yeah so being a conf being the confessions of a mask one of the things is that pretty early on he realizes that you know he's going to have to adopt a persona in order to function in the world and to be a normal person and you know normal person in his eyes and uh, he he also later on then the segment i'm about to read later on he realizes that or he decides or feels that everybody is doing this that there is always this sort of mask but here's an idea of where he talks about um uh, uh, later on he starts to get into cross-dressing and or he starts to do that uh, and feels the impression that wearing a disguise uh, has on him but here is a period where he talks about childhood the period of childhood is a stage on which time and space become entangled. For example, there was the news I heard from adults concerning events in various countries, the eruption of a volcano, say, or the insurrection of an army, and the things that were happening before my eyes, my grandmother's spells or the petty family quarrels, and the fanciful events of a fairy tale world in which I had just then become immersed. These three things always appeared to me to be of equal value and like kind. I could not believe that the world was any more complicated than a structure of building blocks, nor that the so-called social community, which I must presently enter, could be more dazzling than the world of fairy tales. Thus, without my being aware of it, one of the uh, determinants of my life had come into operation, and because of my struggles against it, from the beginning of ever from the beginning, my every fantasy was tinged with despair, strangely complete and in itself resembling passionate desire. And uh, this is kind of alluded to in the very first line of the book, but um, he's one of the things that is. Uh, I can't decide exactly whether he's doing it intentionally fictionalized or if he's like Nabokov and just has a really insane recall. Um, Nabokov might also be fictionalizing it, but he has very clear descriptions of what it is like being very, very young. And so the very first line is, for many years I claimed I could remember things seen at the time of my own birth, uh, and then and then he goes on. But I don't know whether it's it. a lot of this is colored by the fact that he is like in the book, it is very clearly established that this is a man who is still alive, currently present, sitting at a table writing these confessions. Um, and so I don't know if it is meant to be implied that uh, he is using all of the knowledge of his life to backwards, backward conce conceptualize um, uh, a lot of the things that happen that happened. And you you get that because you know not a lot of dialogue happens uh, until it's very. Uh, informative dialogue or impressions. So, uh, yes, he'll be having conversations with friends at school or he'll be having conversations with family members. But in between all of that, it is very much like, uh, and then I thought this and this was the impression that I got and this is what maybe my mum was thinking at this time and then the, the conversation will continue. Uh, 
And coming back to what I was talking about with uh, cross-dressing and, and building up this persona, he summarizes it very beautifully in this line. My every point down to the very tips of my fingers had to be made worthy of the creation of mystery. This is a, an early, early memory or an early sensation that he has, which sort of fe feeds or, or into his sadomasochism uh, and especially his kind of glorification of going to war and fighting in it. This is when he's four, uh, when he's four years old. I was enraptured with the vision of my own form lying there, twisted and fallen. There was an unspeakable delight in having been shot and being on the point of death. It seemed to me that since it was I, even if actually struck by a bullet, there would surely be no pain. So he has this glorification, this sort of dis, uh, this disconnect from the idea of actually feeling like, like the kind of terror or the horror of feeling pain. Um, uh, for him, it's it's just glorious because he has these images in his mind that uh, uh, you know that he's seen from these books and that he's that he's learned as he's gone on. This is a cool idea. This is uh, the start of the, of part two where he's starting to get a little bit older. You can tell that he is uh, kind of backwards applying or. He's either backwards applying an understanding of uh, philosophy uh, or he's representing the fact that at this stage in his life, he's learning it. But um, he writes, uh, when starting to talk about, uh, when starting to talk about attraction to uh, attraction to men, he writes, until then, I had mistakenly thought I was only poetically attracted to such things, thus confusing thus confusing the nature of my sensual desires with a system of aesthetics. And what I like as well is that despite wearing a mask uh, and knowing that he is presenting a persona, uh, Mishima also also is quite aware that he is constructing ideas and archetypes and kind of uh, placing them onto people. So talking about Omi, the character, the schoolboy uh, that he falls in love with. But when I got close enough to see his smiling face distinctly, my heart lo lost its passion for of the moment before when I shouted hey now suddenly I became paralyzed with timidity I was pulled up short by the flashing realization that at heart Omi was a lonely person his smile was probably assumed in order in order to hide the weak spot in his armor which my understanding had chanced upon but this fact did not hurt me so much as it hurt the image I had been constructing of him another great uh, insight or analysis of his own perceptions on Omi my blind adoration of Omi was devoid of any element of conscious criticism, and still less did I have anything like a moral viewpoint where he was concerned. Whenever I tried to capture the amorphous mass of my adoration within the confines of analysis, it would already have disappeared. If there be such a thing as love that has neither duration nor progress, this was, this was precisely my emotion. The eyes through which I saw Omi Omi were always those of a first glance, or, if I may say so, of the primeval glance. It was purely an unconscious attitude on my part, a ceaseless effort to protect my 14-year-old purity from the process of erosion." So yeah, maybe kind of uh, more evidence for the fact that he's backwards applying uh, and like backwards analyzing how he was acting um, uh, in, in those youthful years. This is the part where he really summarizes and just tries to uh, explain how he is feeling like an actor and kind of um, playing a part and that everybody else is doing it. One part of my feeling of sup superiority became conceit, became the intoxication of considering myself a step ahead of mankind. Then, when this intoxicated part became sober more swiftly than the rest, I committed the rash error of judging everything with my sobered consciousness, not taking into consideration the fact that part of me was still drunk. Therefore, the intoxicating thought of, I am ahead of others, was amended to the diffidence of, no, I too am a human being like the rest. Like the rest. Because of the miscalculation, this in turn was amplified into, and also I am a human being like them in every respect. The part of me that was not yet sober, that was not yet sober, made such an amplification possible and supported it. And and at last, I arrived at the very conceited conclusion that everyone is like me. And I wonder, I wonder if this book has a similar uh, kind of rite of passage for youth as as something like Catcher in the Rye does. Uh, I wonder if maybe it it wouldn't because, I mean, I don't know. I haven't read Catcher in the Rye, so um, I mean, let me know. Let me know uh, if you think there are any parallels or or if that lines up. But just from what I've heard about Catcher in the Rye, I haven't necessarily. I, I don't know if it's the same with Confessions of a Mask. 
Between the intervals of these mental efforts I was making towards artificiality, I would sometimes be overwhelmed with a paralyzing emptiness and, in order to escape, would turn shamelessly to a different sort of daydream. Then immediately I would become quick with life, would become myself, and would blaze towards strange images. Moreover, the flame thus created would remain in my mind as an abstract feeling, divorced from the reality of the image that had caused it, and I would distort my interpretation of the feeling until I believed it to be evidence of passion in inspired by the girl itself. Thus, once again, I deceived myself. So, again, starting to feel ideas of, uh, like, trying to navigate these, um, uh, these relationships where he has a sort of soulful, spiritual love for Sonoko, but not, not any sexual desire, because he's definitely, he's very definitely homosexual. And much later on in the book, as he had, uh, as the uh, like life events and going through the war are starting to separate, uh, start to separate him uh, from Sonoko, he writes, "Absence had emboldened me. Distance had given me had given me claim to normality. I had, so to speak, accepted normality as a temporary employee in the corporation of my body. A person who is separated from one by time and space takes on an abstract quality. Perhaps this was the reason why the blind devotion I felt for Sonoko and my ever-present unnatural desires of the flesh had now been fused within me into a single homogeneous mass and had pinned me immobile to each succeeding instant of time as a human being without any self-contradictions. And I really hope that these extracts are just... Uh, highlighting how great his prose is and how perfectly I think it was you know I mean I can't know for sure if it was perfectly translated but it just feels like this translation was such such a great work um, sometimes sometimes Mishima will sprinkle in some some humor or some humorous uh, images so there is a kind of immodesty that become that becomes only a virgin, differing from the immodesty of a mature woman, and intoxicates the be beholder like a gentle wind. This sort of thing is in bad taste, but is still somehow irresistible, for example, like wanting to tickle a baby." Another bit of almost kind of like tragic self-awareness. A person who has never known happiness has no right to scorn it, but I, but I give an appearance of happiness in which no one can detect any flaw, and so have as much right to scorn it as anyone else. Here is at a part where, after uh, basically they have uh, left each other, Sonoko has actually gone and gotten married, and they are just sort of meeting up, almost sort of like a tryst, but just no, they're not having having sex. They're sort of meeting as, like uncomfortably intimate uh, old friends and this is uh, when he's just talking about some of these relate some of these interactions for a time we carried on a on a meaningless endlessly revolving insincere conversation at times it seemed nothing but a great skidding through empty air it gave us a feeling that we were overhearing a conversation being carried on by two strangers it was a feeling like that felt at the borderline between sleeping and waking when one's impatient efforts to go back to sleep without awakening from a happy dream only make the recapture of the dream all the more impossible i discovered how our hearts as though infected with some malignant virus were being eaten away by the uneasy awakening that was brazenly intruding upon our dream by the futile pleasure of our dream seen at the threshold of consciousness as though at a signal previously agreed upon the disease had attacked both our hearts almost simultaneously we reacted with a show of gaiety as though each of us feared what the other might say at any moment we kept joke upon joke and yeah i won't read any more it kind of it it kind of just like ends shortly after that they go to a dance uh, and then it's just like oh, we should probably leave and then that's the end of the story but um it, overall it was a thoroughly enjoyable read uh, i was you know maybe i was kind of hoping for um some you know uh, some more active uh you know because i went on my whole rant about uh about dorian gray and and the um kind of lgbt themes being a bit a bit uh, underwhelming and in this one it was very present but there wasn't any actual sort of um like uh, male uh, man on man relationships and I'm not just talking about like reading sex scenes or anything I'm just talking about like um, uh, you know like what it would be like to be a gay couple in early Japan where, whereas this is what it's like being a gay man in Japan and sort of needing to hide that and, and repress that um, so yeah nonetheless interesting uh, and uh, nonetheless a really really great book hope you enjoyed thank you thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video